Today, we are so happy to have Carol Keogh of Keogh Law Firm, a PLLC today. Once you hear from Carol, we'll open up the forum for questions and answers. So let me go ahead and introduce Carol at this time. Carol is a board certified in labor, is a board certified attorney in labor and employment law for 19 years, a practicing attorney for 28 years, and will lead today's presentation. Carol, I'm gonna let you take it away. Thanks so much for being here today. Okay, thanks, Cindy. All right, there we go. And um, good morning, everyone. So glad that you could join us. I know that a lot of you have been involved in the other act, the CARES Act, which involves um, a payment protection program and loans. But now it's time to kind of take a look back at the Families First Coronavirus Response Act because this is an act where you have employees that are working for you and for some reason are not able to work and we're going to explain that. You may have an obligation to give them paid sick leave or emergency uh, FMLA leave. So let, with that, we're just going to get going. <clears throat> of course, I always put a disclaimer in the beginning, you know, as a lawyer, um, we put this because we want everyone to understand that, you know, we do this as a, for educational purposes only for the chamber, basically. And we're answering our questions here generally and not specifically because we don't really have attorney client privilege or attorney client relationships with you, but we want to give you some legal information that we think is helpful and i um, happy to answer your questions when we get to the end of the presentation. So don't hesitate to send those off to Sherry as we're going along so we can get to those. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today, all right? We're going to talk about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. What is it? How does it going to affect your business? There's two parts to it. There's the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, and as you know with the government, there's always a lot of acronyms, so it's EPLSA, and the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, EFMLEA. And I'm going to talk about each one of those, but I'm also going to tell you when is paid sick leave mandated and under what conditions, what reasons, and what is the test for unable to work or telework under the statute, and when is expanded family and medical leave required. There's some exemptions and exclusions you should know about. Then I like to always give you some tips, tips for the employer in um, trying to comply with the act. And then at the very end, I'm gonna tell you about the enforcement by the Department of Labor who is overseeing this act. And just so you know, that enforcement has been going on since uh, April the 1st, but until April the 17th, they're being a little lax in allowing you know, employers should try to get a feel for this act, but on April the 17th, they will come back with full enforcement. So this is a good timely um, presentation for you to learn about that. Uh, our Families First Coronavirus Response Act, it was signed into law, made effective on April 1st, 2020, and it runs through to December 31st, 2020. And that's really important for you to know because um, as you um, make your way through all of the loans and the other parts of the CARE Act, which is separate and apart from this, you want to make sure that if you have employees that you and you have fewer than 500 employees, that, and which includes public employers and private employers and nonprofits, um, that you are required as an employer to pay eligible employees paid sick leave in up to 12 weeks of expanded family medical leave, and that's paid 12 weeks when the requirements are met. So there are some exemptions, which I talked about a minute ago. We're gonna go through those, and uh, but you need to know that in some instances where an employer has 50 employees or less, actually less than 50 employees, they may be excused for certain parts of the Paid Leave Act but they may not be excused from the entire act. So we're gonna go through that so you understand what the difference is. First, it's the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. 
um, and under EPSLA. And, and what is this basically? Um, under this act, basically there's gonna be six reasons which qualify the employee for paid sick leave. The first three allow a full-time employee to receive up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at the employee's average regular rate of pay. That's what they get paid on a normal basis, including um, other certain benefits that may be included in the regular rate of pay. It's the same thing that you look at when you go to pay time and a half. So that's the exact same regular rate of pay. And then the second three reasons only allow for two thirds of the average regular rate of pay. And there only needs to be one reason that the employee qualifies for paid sick leave under this act. So when you're looking at this, you're, you're gonna wanna make sure, you know, that you know what that reason is and whether or not that employee actually qualifies for the paid sick leave. Um, after, uh, when the employee has, has told you um, that they need paid sick leave and they are required to give you notice. They are required to make sure that you know that they are, are in need of paid sick leave and they need to give you the reasons why they're in need of paid sick leave and a number of other things so that you have a record of why you gave them paid sick leave and why they qualified for paid sick leave. You need to know under this act, although we look at full-time, you know, sometimes we, the, we look at full-time and part-time a little bit differently in our jobs under this act, Full-time is defined as 40 or more hours per week, work week, but part-time is less than 40 hours per work week. So basically, if an employee is working 39 hours, they're listed as part-time under this act, and they would be paid um, the average of what they would earn over two, two work weeks, and whereas the full-time employee would get up to 80 hours of um, paid leave under this act. So it's really important to understand that, you know, notice by the employee, this is gonna be very different for you because I know many of you are out there and you have all of your employee handbooks and you have all these rules about, you know, if an employee doesn't call in, what happens, how many hours they have to call in, if they're not gonna be present at work. But under the emergency paid sick leave, there is a lot more leeway for the employee to call in. So. Um, all they have to do is call in as soon as practicable, and they may not have to call in for the first day that they're absent. And not only that, but, in, but a family member can call in for them, or they can call over the phone, or they can email you. They, they have any number of ways under the act that they can give you notice that they need paid sick leave. Now, it's foreseeable for them, so, for example, if they're calling in to get paid sick leave because their child's daycare is closing in three days, that's foreseeable for them. And as soon as practicable, as soon as they have that information, basically, they have to let you know that they're gonna need paid sick leave under this act. But it could be unforeseeable. What if they're sick? What if they have the corona, you know, coronavirus? So if they're sick um, and they can't do it or they have to self-quarantine or some reason exists. So for example, suppose you have a relative who's taking care of your kids under the age of 14 and all of a sudden they can't do it because they've been told by their medical care provider that they are very susceptible to this disease and they need to stop taking care of those kids immediately and self-quarantine during this time frame. So therefore, you as the parent now have the full-time daycare responsibility because you don't have that caregiver anymore. And so in that circumstances, it wasn't foreseeable for you and you're probably scrambling around trying to figure out what to do and you may not remember as the employee to call in immediately like you normally would. So you um, policies like the no call, no show, you know, if you don't call within a few hours or... If you um, also, you know, it's if you don't call within um, the first day, it's a voluntary quit. Well, none of those are going to be allowed under this um, act. What's going to happen is if an employee doesn't call in and give you notice, you under this act as the employer are obligated to contact them. And so that's going to be very different for you 
um, as most of our policies that we write for employers put the burden on the employee. So it's to give the employees a chance and it's for you to give you're supposed to be giving a little leeway under these acts because the purpose is for get for these employees who are put in situations that they didn't, you know, create to get the paid sick leave if they need it. So keep that in mind and also keep in mind um, that the employer um, can get tax credits, all right? Tax credits for the paid sick leave and for the um, family medical leave, the emergency med family medical leave, and the tax credits could be up to the full amount of the leave. But there is a little caveat on this, and that is you want to get the tax credit, you have to document how you gave leave, who you gave leave to, and all the reasons for leave. So there's some requirements that the IRS is putting, imposing on this act for for you as the employer in order for you to get tax credits. So I don't want you to end up short at the end of the day and not get tax credits, full tax credits for what you have paid out when you're entitled to that. So you have to remember that documentation is gonna be important. I'm gonna remind you of that a little later again. Um, and don't just think, well, I paid out the money, I have a copy of the check. That is not gonna cut it. It's not going to meet the IRS standards for getting the tax credits. So what you're going to need is specific information based on the type of leave that's been taken. And we're going to go over more detail of the leave so you'll have it, so you'll understand what kinds of things you should be putting down and keeping records of so you can get your full tax credit. So there is really six reasons that an employee can get paid sick leave to the extent that the employee is unable to work or telework due to a COVID-19 reason, basically. So I've shortened them here. I put them in six, you know, six little capsules and I've highlighted in blue for you, these are words that have special meaning under the statute, unable to work or telework. You know, you need to know what that means under the statute. So it's not just, you know, if an employee goes home, and you, you know, they are able to telework for you at home, um, then they are not going to qualify for leave under this statute. All right. And, but you need to keep this in mind because there's a couple of other tricky little things that are going to come up as we go along. And I'm going to tell you about them, um, about that. So we're going to go over in detail each one of these reasons. So that should help you get an idea. And if you have questions about any of these reasons, be sure and write those down and we'll ask, answer those later. First, there is a test basically for unable to work or telework. So an employee may not take paid sick leave, all right? They may not take it if the employer has work for the employee to perform and the employer permits the work to be performed where the employee is located isolated or quarantined, and there are no extenuating circumstances such as serious symptoms of COVID-19. Or if the employer closes the work site, work site completely and has no work available for any employee, basically all the employees are laid off, their avenue is to go get unemployment and not paid sick leave. They will not be eligible for paid sick leave if there's simply no work available. And keep in mind when you're talking about telework, it's usually no less work than if it was being performed at the employer's work site, work site. And it requires pay as if the employee were working at the place of business and the employee must be paid for all hours work, which the employer knew or should have known were worked by the employee. So if you had an agreement with an employee who's a part-time employee that they will work 30 hours per week, then you know that they should be able to work the 30 hours per week. That's what telework is about, unless you and the employee have an agreement that's different from that. But normally um, the employee is gonna be working whatever schedule they had before when they were at the office, they're only going to be doing it as telework. And the, the important part of this is unable to work or telework, that's the first requirement to get paid sick leave. And that's the first requirement for you to get um, expanded family medical leave. So to qualify for those, that they have to meet that requirement. 
not able to work or telework. So here's some of the reasons. So what here, the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. So the way the final rule is on this particular, um, let me just, we're kind of covered up here. All right. So um, the final rule means, and that's the rule that the Department of Labor has in place that all the employers have to follow, is um, so quarantine or isolation orders can mean orders that advise some or all citizens to shelter in place, stay at home, quarantine, or otherwise restrict their own mobility. So what happens here is, say for instance, your employee cannot um, they are still on your payroll, and you would have had work for them, but because Harris County has said they have to stay home, they can't go to your office to do the work, and you don't have telework for them, but you have actually would have had work for them, and they're still on your payroll. They can qualify for two weeks of paid sick leave under those reasons. Uh, the second is they're advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. So what that is, it's, it's a little bit broader than you might think um, in that it's not just, it's not just whether or not um, the person believes they have symptoms of COVID-19, it's whether their healthcare provider, some healthcare provider has told them that the provider has a belief that the employee has COVID-19, may have COVID-19, or is particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. And in certain circumstances, these employees can take two weeks paid sick leave. Um, for instance, if their health care provider has said to them, all right, you're over the age of 69, you have, um, you have an underlying lung condition, and you are particularly susceptible to this disease, so you are going to need to self-quarantine to protect yourself from this disease. They can get up to two weeks paid sick leave for that. The third one is the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. And what this means basically is you can get paid sick leave but in this particular instance, it's going to be limited to the reason that the time the employee is unable to work because he or she had to take affirmative steps to obtain a medical diagnosis. So they, um, they have symptoms and, and however long it takes for them to get a test, to get some telemedicine um, medical provider to... Uh, um, allow them to get a test at their office, whatever it takes for them to get an actual medical diagnosis. During that time frame, they can receive paid sick leave. The fourth reason is the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order as described in number one or who has been advised as described in number two. So. For this reason, it must be an immediate family member, a roommate, or a similar relationship that creates an expectation of care if the person is quarantined. So that's what the Department of Labor is looking for. And why have I put in these explanations? It's because if you have an employee who calls in and says, well, um, I'm taking care of um, this guy down the block and he has no relationship with them, no immediate family member, not a roommate, um, they are not gonna qualify for paid sick leave um, unless they have a prior relationship that shows that they would have been expected to provide that person with um, assistance and they cannot work because of it. And so the, when you look at this, that's, you gotta have that in writing or you have to have some form or something that you're giving these employees so that you know exactly who it is they were taking care of and what the relationship of the person was because at the end of the day you want to come back and you want to get credit if you pay them for the paid sick leave and they may not be 
qualified for it, and that paid sick leave might have needed to be denied. And if you paid it, you may not get the tax credit for it. So part of that is important for you to remember um, on this particular um, issue. This next one is pretty easy, actually. It's caring for a son or daughter. And one thing you need to know about this is it's because the school or the place of care has been closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions, all right? So a son or daughter includes anyone over the age of 18 who cannot care for themselves. So a son or daughter can include a son or daughter who actually is, um, uh, has some type of disability, some type of physical or mental disability where they are unable to care for themselves and you as the parent have lost your care provider and therefore you are required to take care of that particular um, individual. So keeping kind of this in mind, um, just kind of remember that for each of these reasons, that you, you're you collecting documentation to support what your reasons are and why you paid out the leave, in addition to the documentation to show you actually paid out the leave. Number six is we really don't know what it means because <laughs> there's been no explanation by the Department of Labor, but what they're talking about is if the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury related to the IRS, have agreed that if someone is experiencing a substantially similar condition that they have identified, then they would also be able to take paid sick leave. Well, so far they haven't described that, so we don't really, you know, we put a question mark there. We're not sure what they're gonna come up with. So you've heard about the paid sick leave, that's the two weeks leave, but there also is another type of leave here for um, employees, and that is the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, EFMLEA. So I know that a lot of you are familiar with the FMLA. FMLA usually requires that you have at least 50 employees. Not the case here, all right? So here, any employer that has less than 500 employees qualifies to provide as an employer emergency family and medical leave expansion. Okay, so, and what this en encompasses is it's going to encompass up to 12 weeks of paid leave. All right, and the first two weeks are unpaid, but the 12 weeks, the remaining 10 weeks are paid. And it's gonna be paid at two thirds of that regular rate of pay that we talked about um, with a cap of $200 per day. So, Normally, you know, you're thinking family medical leave, that doesn't apply to me. Well, in this particular case, it, it is going to apply to you. And it's going to apply to a lot of the people in the chamber that have less than 500 employees. There may be some exclusions, but for the most part, um, the exclusions are going to be very detailed and a little bit difficult to get an exclusion or exemption under this statute. So you should be aware that you may have to pay this emergency family and medical leave expansion for employees who you would have worked for, but for, for one of the, um, the reasons that we're gonna tell you here for EFMLEA, you, they cannot work or telework. So one of the things that's required is you don't have to give this leave unless the employee's been um, we're with you for at least 30 calendar days. And, um, but there's no requirement that that be consecutive. So, you know, if they were working for you for 10 or 15 days and then you hire them back and they work another 15 days, they could qualify for the sleep. If you, um, the qualifying need has to be related to a public health emergency. Well, that's pretty much what we got going on here where the employee is unable to work or telework because of a need to care for a son or daughter under the age of 18, whose school place of childcare is closed or the childcare provider is unavailable. And that's like I told you before, um, you know, if you have a family member who was doing the childcare and they can no longer do the childcare, well, that um, 
would allow one parent, not both parents, just one parent to qualify for the emergency family and medical leave expansion. So keep that in mind and keep in mind also for those parents that are dealing with a son or daughter who's 18 or older and has a medical or physical disability and is unable to care for themselves because of that disability. So total 12 weeks, first two weeks are unpaid um, but you can substitute. So for example, if you're in your employment, just like under the regular Family Medical Leave Act, um, you are allowed to substitute if you have paid sick leave available and you want to substitute that in for the first two unpaid weeks, you are allowed to do that under the statute. However, the employer cannot force the employee to use their paid sick leave for that reason. So you, you have to, you know, have a discussion with your employee and try to figure out what do they want to do. And the other thing that they can do is they can take the paid sick leave, which we just talked about under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, and they can make that the first two weeks. So they would get 12 paid weeks total if they do that. So there are some exemptions and exclusions. And one of the, um, I know a lot of um, em employers, um, a lot of them out there, they may be healthcare providers or emergency responders. And the law exempts providing paid sick leave under EPSLA or EFMLA under certain reasons for one or more employees. Um, if they're, a uh, healthcare provider or an emergency responder. And so uh, what, what that means, it's very broad, actually, one of the things that you would want to know um, as an employer is that for this definition, it can be anyone who's employed at a doctor's office, hospital, healthcare center, clinic, uh, some institution that offers healthcare instruction, medical school, um, health and department or agency, nursing, pharmacies. Um, but the, the act is read a little bit broader for healthcare provider in that you need to know that this could also include an individual employed by an entity that contracts with any of those institutions that I just kind of went over with you. So if you, if you have a con contract with them and you're important to the medical service that's provided. So for example, if you provide um, medical equipment, hospital medical equipment, you know, a lot of times that's not provided when people leave the hospital. But if, if you provide that kind of equipment to a hospital, then you may be uh, having your employees be exempt under the healthcare providers um, exclusion. And the emergency responders are pretty much just what you think. It's gonna be all police, military, fire, anybody who um, qualifies as an emergency responder, ambulance um, drivers, uh, EMT, all those types of personnel do not um, qualify for paid leave under EPSLA and EFMLEA. The other reason is um, for certain employers that have fewer than 50 employees, they may apply for um, an exemption um, to provide paid leave. And, but this is very, it's very specific in that an authorized officer of the business has to determine that the leave requested would result in the small business's expenses and financial obligations exceeding the business revenue cause the business to cease operating at a minimal capacity. And the only qualifying part in this is those parts of leave that give you leave for um, the school, daycare closures, not having a caregiver. So it doesn't apply to paid sick leave if somebody has uh, the one, the first three reasons that, or four reasons that we talked about, somebody actually has COVID-19 and or the symptoms or seeking a medical, it doesn't apply to any of those. It's only going to apply to um, the, the school caregiver closure part of the statute. And the absence of an employer and employees requesting leave entails substantial risk 
to the financial health or operational ability of the business, and there are not sufficient workers who are able and available to perform the labor and services needed to operate at a minimal capacity. And the authorized officer of the business is going to be required to certify those three reasons to the Department of Labor if they are taking an exemption. So it isn't just that under 50 employees is exempt. It requires a lot of detail and thought on your part if you are an employer and you want to take this exemption. It's not impossible to get, but you've got to have the um, documentation for those three reasons if you want to be exempt. And keep in mind that doesn't exempt everything. You still may have some requirements under both of these acts. Well, basically um, under the uh, EPSLA for the COVID-19, if they have the disease or any of the reasons that are not having to do with childcare or daycare closures. So here's um, a few tips for you. Um, I want you to kind of keep in mind that you know, one of your goals as the employer is to try to provide some relief for the employees. Um, they can get under the EFMLEA, they can get up to 12 weeks per year. And that implies to all levels of FMLA leave. So if you're an employer that already has 50 or more employees, all right, you and they've already, and someone in your organization, an employee has already taken three weeks of that leave during the same year, well then they would only be eligible for nine weeks. So it's a total of 12 weeks of FMLA leave, including the EFM LEA. So if they haven't taken any leave, they could qualify for the full 12 weeks. And you gotta remember it's not retroactive. So if they started, you know, if they, their school was closed prior to April 1st, their leave cannot begin until April 1st. And, and their leave has to fall within that time frame, April 1st to December 31st. So what I'm encouraging you to do is you should have a policy and should have forms for the employee to fill out to certify the need for leave, or it is going to be difficult to support the tax credits. If an employee fails to provide documentation needed to support the tax credits, um, the employer may not be required to provide leave, but, one that, that has a little caveat on it because you have to give employees under this statute a lot of second chances, all right? And in that case, you have to give them a second chance and you have to give them the chance or the opportunity to um, come back and provide the right documentation to you so their leave is not denied. Um, I want to, I've, I've cited to you um, two sites here for the IRS, um, so that you can take a look at this and you can go and look at what is the IRS going to make me tell them for these tax credits so I can get my full tax credits. So I would advise you to look at what the IRS is requiring and make sure you have that information for every employee that takes leave. Um, an employee is required to give notice, like I said, of the need for leave. If it's foreseeable, it's as soon as practicable. Keep in mind oral notice is permitted, but don't just take oral notice and not write down, you know, the information that um, you're required to write by the IRS. Um, and you can't penalize an employee for no notice until the leave is taken for a day or a part of a day, and then the employer has to then give the employee notice first before they can have any penalty that they need to complete forms for the leave before they take any action at all. So a lot of onus is on the employer to give the, to give the um, proper notice back to the employee to allow them to fix whatever situation they've got on so that they can you know, actually get the leave. And that's gonna be important when we come to enforcement. So the employer is required to post, if you haven't already done this, the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act poster from the Department of Labor. Um, you have to meet this posting requirement even if some of your employees are teleworking 
Well, then you have to email it to them and you have to have proof that you posted this poster. It's a requirement no matter what, whether you think you're exempt, 50 or fewer employees, whatever, every employer with fewer than 500 employees must post this poster. They may not qualify for the leave your employees because you may be exempt for certain reasons or they may be a healthcare, um, you may be a healthcare um, person and, or a first responder, but you still have to post the um, poster. Um, when, here's something that we haven't talked about, but on return from leave, an employee has a right to be reinstated to the same or an equivalent position. Unless the employer can show the employee would not otherwise have been employed at the time of reinstatement. So if the employee starts to take a leave, a paid sick leave, and the entire business is required to shut down and everybody is laid off, you would be required to make the payment for the paid sick leave up until the time the business closed or all the employees were laid off. And one of the things that's tricky here for you as the employer is this is not a good time for you to say, oh, we didn't really like John anyway, let's just lay him off. Because you are going to be called on the carpet for reasons why that person got laid off and other workers maybe um, didn't get laid off. So you've got to have reasons, you've got to have it documented. And I know this sounds like a lot for the employer with everything that you're going through. And that's why I want you to have this information because I think that a lot of employees are gonna, employers are gonna fall through the cracks. And when this comes and reaches the other end of where we are and the businesses come back, um, there is going to be potential litigation for um, employers who haven't complied with this act. You need to keep any records of this leave for four years. So you have to create the records and you have to maintain them for four years. And you have to maintain, if you have a health coverage policy in place that the employee had at the time of leave, they have the right to maintain that policy during the time they're on leave, but they would also have to continue paying whatever premiums they paid before. And the employer would have to pay their part if they did that before. And all employees, both full and part-time, are counted to determine the definition of an employer. So if you are looking to see if you know you fall within that less than 500, all employees are counted full and part-time. And leave may be taken intermittently, which is if both the employer and the employee agree, you have to have this agreement in writing that allows for intermittent leave. And what that means is, let me kind of give you an example. Suppose there's two, um, two parents at home and you get a deal with your husband or spouse and say, look, I need to work four hours at least a day. I'll take the kids in the morning, you know, for the first four hours. And then I'm going to work in the afternoon for the rest of the four hours. And then you're going to take the kids in the afternoon. So you can cut that arrangement with them, but you have to tell your employer and get a written agreement for that. The reason being is you just, as you know, from other things that, you know, um, in, in the classes I've taught before, or just from your own experience as an employer, if you don't have it in writing, then anybody can make up what they said the agreement was, right? And puts you at risk as an employer. So you want to, um, you want to try to cooperate with your employees if you can possibly allow them to take intermittent leave um, and that works for both of you, then you can reach an agreement on that. If, one or, if you as the employer or the employee says, no, I don't wanna do intermittent leave, that's it, you, you, you can't do it. And I wrote down here in big letters, document, document, document. This is the same thing that we tell all our clients whenever we're dealing with employees. You have to document what was said. You have to get them to submit information to you if you need it and put it in writing and do forms and things that you can turn around and protect your business. Because if you don't, there will be litigation that probably will follow this, some of this when everything is working again and everything's up and running 
and you don't want to be on the short end of the stick. You want to have documentation that's going to protect your business. And that is because here's what um, the enforcement part of this statute is under the Department of Labor. Uh, EFM LEA prohibits interference with the exercise of rights, discrimination, and interference with proceedings or inquiries as described by the FMLA. So if you interfere with somebody taking their rights under the EFMLA, uh, you will be in trouble, okay, later on with the Department of Labor. And what happens is if, you're, if you have less than 50 employees, the employee can go right in and file a complaint with the Department of Labor on any requirement that you created or you made that maybe wasn't in line with the law, all right? They and it's supposed to be in writing, but, you know, my experience with the Department of Labor is you call in and you give them a complaint and they put it in writing for you and they just send it out to you to sign. So don't think that's going to stop people from complaining. So if they have more than 50 employees, then they can go right ahead and file in court against you. So it's really important. This act is, does have some consequences for the employer. And so it's important that you're following it. And under the paid sick leave part of this, um, you can't discharge, discipline, or discriminate against any employee because they took paid sick leave or if they filed a complaint or instituted any proceeding under the EPSLA. And this is something that the Department of Labor has put right in the CFRs, which are the regulations, that if you fail to pay paid sick leave under EPSLA, it's gonna be treated like you're not paying minimum wage. And all the penalties in the statute that go along with your failure to pay a minimum wage to employees Will go against you for failing to pay paid sick leave. So that's kind of the end of the presentation. I want to thank you for the Chamber of Commerce for hosting the Employment Law Seminar um, for all their members at a critical time for businesses in our in our country. And um, I have my contact information. I do want to thank Susan Dawson, who is an attorney out of Ohio, who assisted with some of the slides in this presentation. And I think if Sherry has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Carol. We appreciate you um, providing this information. It's a lot of information for our uh, members to absorb and to pass on to their, um, their employees and to know for their own protection as well. And so we'll have these slides available and um, we'll, we will put the recording on our YouTube channel as well. So I think you can get that off of our website. So now um, I wanna introduce Sherry Sweeney, our Vice President of the Clear Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. She's gonna serve as today's moderator for the question and answer por portion of the webinar. So Sherry, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks so much, Carol. This is amazing information that everybody needs. And thank you for providing your uh, slides because it's a lot. And so people may want to look it over and, and, and study it quite a bit. I do have a few questions though for you. And everybody okay. remember, you can ask questions at any time. I can get to Carol. I know where to find her. And so <laughs> if uh, you have questions that come up later on, she's happy to help you out and answer those. Um, but let's start with the first one is, can an, can an employer require the employee to provide written notice from a doctor or closure of a day, excuse me, daycare facility. So what what the the situation is is, you know, uh, eventually the employer can get documentation from a doctor, but on the time that they're absent, when they're first absent, you can't require that of the employee. You have to be more liberal about allowing them time because they can't get to the doctors. A lot of the doctors can't give written <laughs> documentation that the employee is sick. So what you have to do is you want to let your employee know, I would like you to seek documentation from your doctor, you know, either by email or telemedicine or however you can to show that you qualify. And I will keep that requirement in place and expect you to um, I'll remind you, and I would expect you to try to get it. So they're not excused from getting it, but they ha you can't, you just can't hammer them on it like you might um, normally be able to do. So was what was the other part of that is? 
Well, like if their daycare facility is closed, you need documents. Can you get documentation for that as well? Can you require and that? When you, when you, um, if their, if their daycare facility is closed, it would be helpful because most of the daycare facilities have sent out emails or given paper copies of paper. Our daycare is being closed. We're going to close in three days. They're giving out information because mm -hmm. Um, they have to close as well. And of course, everybody knows about the school closures. <laughs> That's kind of public knowledge. So, um, but the, the way you document that is you, you create, you know, you have some type of a form where you look at those IRS reasons for you to get reimbursed and you make sure you have that information. So you, you know, if your child is if you have a child and they're under the age of 14, you, you know, you want to get that information from the employee because not every employer knows about everybody's children. Mm. And the, a lot of employers don't know that, they, that somebody has a child that's over the age of 18 and disabled. So oh. they, they would have the right to get that type of leave. So you as the employer need to give them something to document that for you, send them an email or whatever you can, and then be, be flexible about the time and getting it back. Say, you know, I'd like to have this back, you know, by this and give them a date, you know, and a time. And if they fail to do that, then write them back again. Because this is all about second chances. And when you're looking at the Department of Labor, they are going to be all about this statute was created for the employees it's to give them some immediate relief. And they're going to be liberal about making sure that the employers did their best to give the relief. But that doesn't mean that you have to give paid sick leave if they don't meet those conditions or those reasons. So documentation is important. Wonderful. Uh, Gail Nelson, who's with Family Promise of Clear Creek, is asking if nonprofits are exempt from the EFMLEA. Uh, no, they're not exempt. Okay, okay. now they, they may qualify for that under 50 exemption that I talked about. So, uh, the, the, you know, the executive officer of the business um, or the nonprofit can get them to qualify for that because they may not, you know, they, that may put the business under, that may put the nonprofit under if they, mm. you know, and if they document those three things, which is in the slides, I put it in the slides, which you're going to put up for them. Mm -hmm. If they document that information and they meet those qualifications and an executive officer can um, certify to that or the, you know, the head of the board of directors or whoever it is that would be, you know, have um, the right to make that statement on behalf of the organization, um, they could qualify. So it, it's not a, you know, give up and forget about it. You don't qualify it. You if you're less than 500 employees, unless you meet that exemption, you are going to qualify. So just to keep in mind, but so that's your job to kind of figure out, how am I going to get to qualify for this? And right. right. <laughs> but the under 50 employee goes across the board, profit, nonprofit, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. You know, um, they can, anybody under 50 employees can um, try to qualify for that exemption. And you may very well qualify. I okay. mean, you know, some businesses, um, for example, if you're an event planner, think about it. Not, not a lot of events going on. Right? <laughs> you're going to have a busy fall if you're an event you know, planner. But a, lot of, but a lot of people are still trying to keep on some core employees, even though, mm -hmm. you know, even though they don't have events, they're having them do other things, some marketing and stuff. They're just trying to keep on some core employees because they don't want to lose their good health. True. Right. They, Very you know, true. So, yeah. But they may, they may qualify if they have zero income coming in. I mean, I don't know. I would look at those reasons and see if they could fit into them. Okay. Fantastic. Another question is, uh, folks want to know where to get that poster that they're required to post. Um, the poster is available free at the Department of Labor, um, you can go up to the Wage and Hour Department of Labor and just put in FFCRA poster. And they actually have it there for you to download. It's free. So oh, very good. Uh, everybody, everybody can get that. It's easy. Just go on the internet. 
and and um, and if you as soon as you put in, you know, don't let people sell it to you really because you don't. <laughs> they don't need to sell it to you. I mean, right? Download it and then you can make it bigger, <laughs> or you can email it to your employees. So. Wonderful. Um, Rob Carlson, who is our counselor for SBDC, um, asks, when counting the number of employees, I assume it is the total number of bodies as opposed to calculating a full-time equivalent number of employees. Right. It's not the full-time equivalent like the other statute. Okay. Okay. Full-time, part-time, you know, whoever is working at the time of the leave being requested all right at the time of this being an you know so if you have you know if you have five less than 500 employees which is not hard just about everybody you know a lot of the chamber members have less than 500 employees there are those yes. that have more than 500 you know are going to be in a different position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, well, uh, like I said before, if anyone has more questions pop up, especially after you study these slides a little further, uh, please email them to me, shari at clearlakearea.com, and I will get them to Carol, and she is fabulous uh, answering all of those questions for us. So thanks, Carol. I'm going to turn it back over to Cindy. Thank you again, Carol and Sherry, for that. And for those of you that ask questions, I'm sure we're going to um, have some more questions on that matter. And as it, as it comes up, I'm sure there's going to be some questions because you think maybe that doesn't apply to me, but unfortunately, it's, it's um, a matter of, of um, the state that we're in right now. So thanks again. We encourage you to attend our other COVID-19 seminars coming up. Let me highlight a few of those for you that are coming up on, uh, or a few announcements that are coming up on Wednesday, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, the 15th, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, the um, One Clear Lake, those are our nonprofit friends, will participate in uh, the fundraising in the midst of COVID-19. So those of you that are, that are involved with a, a nonprofit or even um, serve on a board or committees of nonprofits, we encourage you to attend those. And uh, next, is at four o'clock tomorrow, we're gonna to have a virtual happy hour. So we hope to see you all at a business after hours on screen, see your faces and um, hear your voices. We're looking forward to that for sure. Uh, the 16th, Thursday the 16th is another COVID-19 webinar at 10 o'clock and it's distance leading, maintaining co um, cohesive and motivation. So let's, um, let's get that together. I hate calling it, um, um, social distancing because we don't have to be distant socially. We just have to be distant physically. And so let's, um, let's get together with the seminars and do that. The 21st, Tuesday the 21st at two o'clock is our next COVID-19 uh, webinar series in um, challenge of changes. Change is inevitable, growth is optional. So I think that's gonna be a great topic because we know change is coming. For more information or to register, please go to our website at clearlakearea.com or check your emails because we'll be emailing you the notices as well. So um, everybody have a great chamber day. Go out there. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. And let's keep, our, um, keep your chin up and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks so much.